everyone and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast and it's the first of our Bloody Scotland podcasts. Bloody Scotland for anyone who doesn't know, Scotland's International Crime Writing Festival which is on this year between the 15th and 17th of September in Stirling. And this podcast is related to the Bloody Scotland debut prize and I'm joined by some of the authors on the shortlist. I'll just run through them to uh, introduce you. We've got Heather Critchlow. Hello Heather. Hello. Kate Foster. Hello, Kate. Hi. Uh, Callum McSorley. Hi, Callum. Yeah. And Fulton Ross. Hello, Fulton. Hello. And the one missing is Heather Darwin, who unfortunately can't be with us, um, but we might get on to talk about her novel as well. So before we go to talk about all things crime writing more generally, I think <laughs> it'd be nice to get a little bit about each novel, and I'm just going to go in the, the list I've got here. So Heather, could, what can you tell us about Unsolved? Well, it's sort of the fusion, really, between a fascination with true crime and also a love of the Aberdeenshire landscape, where I partly grew up. Um, so it's the first in the Cal Lovett series about a true crime podcaster who travels to Aberdeenshire to investigate the cold case of a missing woman when she rode her horse into the woods 35 years previously uh, and vanished and it's a case that's kind of close to his heart because his own older sister Margot disappeared when he was a child and she has never been found either. Uh, that's interesting might talk a little bit about real crime and crime fiction as well and that kind of slight crossover because that is interesting. Sure. Um, Kate what can you tell us about your novel? Uh, so The Maiden is a historical novel um, and it's based on the true story of a Scottish aristocrat who was condemned to death in the 17th century for murdering her lover. Um, Christian Demo was um, sentenced to die at Scotland's guillotine called the Maiden um, after um, her, 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 the man who was her lover and also her uncle um, was stabbed to death under a sycamore tree um, in Christorfin, which is the village that I grew up in. Oh, fantastic. And uh, Callum, tell us about uh, your novel, Squeaky Clean. Uh, so Squeaky Clean is a contemporary uh, crime thriller set in Glasgow and it's about a man called Davy who he works at a car wash um, and he borrows a customer's car to get to a court date. The car gets hijacked and destroyed. It turns out this car belongs to a very dangerous gangster so he now owes this man lots of money and goes to work for him. I have to say uh, I used to live around from that uh, car wash and my parents used it all the time and now i was telling my mum about this and she was going i thought there might be something anyway maybe got onto the <laughs> thing between real life and fictional characters later as well but fulton what can you tell us about the unforgiven dead okay so this is the uh, unforgiven dead here um it's been described as shetland meets m night Shyamalan. it's been uh, inspired by the uh, gallic folk tales and myth and legend and it follows the story of Angus Du McNeil, who is a cop with a, a painful secret, uh, which is that he's a tysher, which is Gaelic for someone who has second sight. But rather than a, a gift, this is a curse that Angus has had to bear since childhood when he saw his, mur his mother's murder before it happened. Subsequent murders have, have taken place over the years, all of which he's seen but been unable to prevent. Um, and essentially, there's been another murder at the start of the book, and he must embrace this dubious gift to prevent more murders unfolding. Well, there's so much to talk to you about because what strikes me immediately is the diversity of the books. You know, you've got historical fiction, you've got real crime, you've got someone in the Highlands, you get someone in the Central Belt. Um, and it does seem to me that crime fiction, perhaps more than any other genre, reaches into almost every part of Scotland at the moment. Do you think that's a fair assumption to say? Um, Fulton, start, start with yourself. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I was thinking when I was looking at the panel here. It's, it's such a, a diverse, um, it's a diverse number of voices, um, and a lot of the debut novels that you're that you're seeing that, that, that writers will appear at Bloody Scotland. There's there's a there's a huge variety of, of different different voices, voices, different genres, and I suppose that's one of the great things about Tart Noir is this kind of umbrella term that kind of encompasses everything from you know Calm's sort of gritty urban setting to myself and Heather's more. Um, Highland or, or rural setting, and then of course you've got Kate's historical novels. So yeah, it's it's, it's one of the, the the great benefits of, of the Tartan noir genre, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. 
I, I love the fact that the books are also different. I had a really fun summer reading everyone else's books and it's a, it, it's really nice actually to be part of this group that represents so many different kinds of fiction related to Scotland and yeah, it's it's really fun. Uh, when I was writing The Maiden or, or thinking about it, I, I didn't think of it as a crime novel at all. I saw it as a historical novel and a, and a kind of retelling of somebody's story. And, and the fact it, even though it's got a crime in it, a murder, and it's and, and, and there's a trial. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 actually it does it does show you how how diverse um you know crime fiction can really be even although um um I I mean I still perceive it as as a, as a woman's story I mean it's it, it still fits into the crime genre really kind of kind of comfortably. And Callum, what do you think about the diversity of Scottish crime fiction in general? Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, obviously, like my novel has been set in Glasgow, and obviously, it's, there's kind of quite a long history of of crime set in Glasgow you know, back to like William McIlvany himself. And it's been it's been really good reading all the books and kind of traveling to different places. Cause I know like I know the Northeast a wee bit. I lived up in Inverurie for a couple of years. And um but yeah it was great kind of going to these different places and, and learning all about uh yeah all those. So it's it's been really great. And okay, let's talk about historical fiction because you and it just even the thing of genre itself because often talk to writers and they'll say like you said well I don't really think of it as crime and then I wonder well is that but you know in terms of the practicalities of selling books there's a big crime section in most bookshops now and you know it can be good to be on that table um is it a part of that or do you not even worry about that is that something for publishers and booksellers to work about I, I just about? I just see crime as being really clever <laughs> and yeah and kind of following certain um certain structures and and surprising the reader you know with twists and turns and i just didn't think that my that, that, that my plotting was sort of clever enough to be considered um to be considered a crime a crime book um so so yes i suppose that was something that that i was a bit a, a bit worried about people i mean the thing is when you've when you've got a book out people are people say things about it that you hadn't thought about yourself i don't know if anybody else has yeah. found that um, you know, people are me calling the the maze a feminist retelling, and I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have kind of sat down and thought, I must write, I must write a feminist retelling. So you know, I I suppose it's kind of very open um, to kind of interpretation as well. Well, I mean, as someone who does uh, who reviews books, I think that's quite an interesting thing. I'll often maybe write a review, and the writer will get in touch and say, I had no idea about that you're sure that they were influenced by someone and they'll say, I have never read any of their books. And it really, that kind of interaction is a really interesting one, I think. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting. I think um, it partly comes from the fact that the crime, the crime writing really reflects society and it reflects our, even though Kate's taking really historical perspective, she's doing it from the eyes of today. And so I suppose that's where the feminist kind of angle comes in, really. Um, and yeah, I, I do think I love that about crime fiction is that it's very reflective of society that we're in and the preoccupations that we currently have uh, and that that kind of comes through the writing, I think. Well, and your own uh, novel, which looks at real crime and real crime podcasts, which is, have suddenly kind of become a huge thing as well. Um, yeah. Why did you want to write about that? And why did you want to fictionalise it in any way? You know, because I suppose you could have done a straight up, you know, uh, almost a telling of a true story. Yeah, so I've always wanted to write fiction. And um, I, I mean, this isn't the first book I'd written. It's the first one I've managed to get published. But then I, I became fascinated by these true crime podcasts, because I think 2014 was when Serial hit, which was the first big one that kind of looked at a miscarriage of justice. And I started listening to them more and more. And I really particularly like the ones that are feature cold cases that have been kind of largely forgotten. But you've got families um, and victims who don't have answers or disappeared people. And there's a particular podcast series I really like um, by a Canadian podcaster, actually, called David Ridgen. And I really like his style because he's very... Um, he's kind of intrepid. He goes off and, and he interviews people and he's got a really sort of sensitive side to him. And it made me think about, you know, what's the cost to you as a true crime podcaster? Often these people go to do a story for a short period of time and end up being sucked into something much bigger. And even years later, they're going back and revisiting cases. 
And I really, I just really love the fact as well that if you're a criminal who's committed a crime 30 years ago and you think you've got away with it, well, you know, hello, <laughs> we're here with True Crime Podcasts now. Um, and they're quite a democratic medium. You don't need a big flashy team of people creating a TV documentary. You can just have a person with a microphone and an iPhone and the determination to try and get to the truth. So, yeah, I really did start to think, you know, what what does why do these people do that? Um, what's the cost to them potentially in their lives uh, of doing that? And that's where my character Cal came from. I mean, he's very much driven by his own sister's unsolved disappearance. And yeah, he goes away for months at a time and weeks at a time, and that has a real impact on his own family. So that's kind of where we find him at the beginning. I think that's interesting. I've spoken to a couple of uh, crime podcasters and they said they feel this sense of duty to the people who are still here and, you know, are still grieving and not missing. And, and, and I mean, it sounds such a, a kind of emotional relationship that you could have with people when you're doing podcasts such as that. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think as a listener as well, you kind of take them with you in your life because you put your headphones in when you're running or you're walking or you're cooking. And sometimes you hear the voices of the people who are missing and you certainly hear the voices of their family and friends. And I do just think it's very powerful. Um, you know, you're not watching anything on a screen. You've got it all in your head. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And, and, and Callum, as you said, there's a great tradition of Glasgow crime fiction, uh, you know, which, which goes way back. Was that something you were aware of when you were writing it and the things to maybe try and avoid and the things to embrace? And also, are you surprised at maybe how people have reacted to it as well? Because there's a lot of humour in that, too. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I was always I was a huge fan of Louise Welsh. As um, I would say, reading the cutting room was my the, probably the first kind of Glasgow set noir story that I read. Because I I really at that time I was reading a lot of hard boiled detective stuff, and it's all it's all set in you know Los Angeles, and it's very glamorous and seedy, and I felt. I, when I read The Cutting Room, Louise Welsh kind of did that, but in a setting that I was really, really familiar with. And it kind of opened my eyes a bit that you could do this. So I maybe was not at that time really aware of this kind of history, but after that point I was. And yeah, and when, I, when I started writing Squeaky Clean, I, I wanted to write something that was, you know, kind of gritty like these stories, but but funny as well. I kind of, I just, I finished writing this um big historical novel that never, it didn't get published in the end and there was a lot of research and it was very arduous work and uh, yeah after that kind of disappointment I just wanted to kind of I wanted to do something that was just I just wanted to write something that I enjoyed that was funny that I didn't have to research and I, I used to work in a car wash and I'd always thought it'd be a great setting for a kind of crime story and, uh, and for a while it kind of um, it, the, the book kind of fell between two stools like uh, when my editor was kind of like is this a crime story or is it just like a couple of guys hanging out at a car wash chatting you know it was kind of like early drafts were very much like that you know and it took you yeah, it took quite a lot of rewriting and work to turn it into like a thriller um uh, that's 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 interesting um again I wonder if I, with having worked in publishing a little bit whether the publisher's going to go and it's crime, it's crime, you know, the kind of slight push to get, see, you'll be able to go to bloody Scotland if you say it's crime. <laughs> and, and Fulton, you know, you were describing your book, it's it's set in the Highlands and a lot of the Gaelic myths and legends are interwoven there and the traditions as well. And is that something that you said, this hasn't been done much before or do you see it as in a, in a tradition already? Um, I don't think it's been done um that that often and possibly not in the way that, I, that I've done it. I, I studied Scottish literature at, at, at uni um, and one of the things I noticed when I came to writing this book was that a lot of the folklore and the fairy tales were not touched upon in, in the sort of the canon of Scottish literature and it just kind of struck me that that these these stories that had been recorded by a sort of handful of Victorian folklorists that they were that they were valuable and they were a, a kind of cultural archive that I could draw on um, and yeah so there was I hope that it generates a bit of interest in these in these tales, um, but like everything in novels, there's a lot a lot of research and not that much makes it into the book. You know, it's it's not like this is very very firmly a contemporary crime novel. It's not you know it's not fantasy. It's not necessarily historical. Um, there is a, a supernatural element in it, 
but it's very grounded. Um, it, was, it was a pains to try and not make it too kind of hokey, which was difficult when you're dealing with something like the second sight. I, I believe um, there are a few authors um, who have had characters who have the second sight. Haven't haven't read any of them. I've kind of maybe purposely tried to steer clear of those so that I'm not influenced at all by how they would write somebody with the second sight. But yeah, like I said, I want to make it seem really re realistic and, and grounded. Um, basically, so as not to put off too many readers. A lot of readers, you mentioned Supernatural, and they're just like, oh, no, it's not for me, no thanks. Um, and of course, it's one of the rules of crime writing. You're not allowed to have supernatural elements in it. It's one of the, the Ten Commandments, that there could be no explanation for your crime that involves anything supernatural. So I kind of run roughshod over that idea. <laughs> That's, is that genuinely a thing that uh, people say? Yeah, that... one of the commandments. Um, I think it was a, a Catholic priest, actually. He was part of... Um, I forget the name of the club, but it included Agatha Christie. And I think it was Knox, his name was, and there was Ten Commandments um, that basically uh, you had to conform to if you're writing crime fiction, such as, you know, there must be the clues must all be set out before then. And there's, there's some weird ones. There's one there's one that, I think something about you're not allowed to, the criminal can't be a Chinaman for some reason. It was, it was off its time, obviously, these things. Is, is there one that's like, uh, you can't have twins? Yes, yeah. twins, not allowed twins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some other bizarre ones, well, but one of them's definitely there can't be a, a, any sort of supernatural explanation for the the committing of the crime. I'm going to have to go and uh, find all of those. That's really interesting. And of course, you'll have a different language. I think you're probably all all the books will have language will be of big importance. Um, uh, Fulton, to continue with yourself, how was it to be able to write in? Your, the language of, of where it's set? I, I felt it was important because a lot of the source material was from a Gaelic, Highland Gaelic background. I'm not a Gaelic speaker, I'm from Fort William. Um, so I, I sometimes think I really should be a Gaelic speaker and I'm, I'm, I keep constantly saying I'm going to do the Duolingo course and learn a bit. But it just struck me as important, especially as, as Angus has second sight. He's called Angus Dew, which is you know Black Angus in Gaelic. Um, so it just struck me as important that he he's from that culture. Um, and I always think of the second site as something that's that's sort of woven into the heritage and culture of that area. Um, so yeah, it was, it was important uh, to to use a bit of Gaelic. And I suppose it's, it's quite handy for readers who don't speak Gaelic, because I don't speak Gaelic, so hopefully that won't put people off. Although I've heard some feedback saying there's lots of Gaelic words that I don't necessarily, that they wouldn't know how to pronounce, but you can just go on learngaelic.com and type them in and you'll get a a pronunciation but yeah it's, it's, it's accessible Gaelic I think but yeah definitely important to to to, to give a flavour of that it adds texture to the whole to the whole thing I think. Absolutely and with historical fiction Kate how do you approach the language there because obviously um, it, most of it would have been spoken rather than written so you don't have maybe the documentation. I, so, so the maiden's told from the perspective of, of, of two different women. Um, one of them is, is Christian Nimmo, who was the real, the real character. She was a real woman. Um, and, I, and I brought in a second character called Violet. Um, and, she, and she is, the, uh, to make it a murder mystery, um, and, and she is um, another, another person who was very heavily involved in the, in the, kind of, um, in the life of uh, James Forrester. She was his other mistress. Um, so in order to differentiate these two characters, I did have Christian is talking about like how I'm talking now, and Violet, uh, um, she's 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 much broader. She's she's a, a sex worker in 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 a in a brothel in in the the, the high street of Edinburgh, and um, she talks like people in my family <laughs> talk. So I kind of made her kind of much more informal. Um, she's kind of swearing for effect, you know. She's she, she's kind of she's centre stage and completely loving it so she's a performer but her language is very Scots and, and very different from from Christian for one reason because I wanted to have these two women um very different for you know for the readers so that when you open the page you know who's talking you don't have to look at the top of the chapter to see it's Christian or Violet and secondly because I just wanted it to be as, as authentically Scottish as I could and um, because I wanted to um you know to kind of just bring that flavour of of you know old Edinburgh into the novel, and I and I was worried about whether the publisher would be okay with it, yeah. um, and and I, I kind of found myself you know really looking carefully at some of Violet's um, passages, 
Um, but actually, I got away with a lot of it, and 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 even in even in terms of the audio book, they got two Scottish um, actresses in to you know just to do these voices. So it, the whole thing um, was done really really authentically. I hadn't thought about audio books. Uh, have they? Are, do they all have audio versions? All of the books. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How interesting. Uh, and going back to Fulton, so you've got someone speaking Gaelic who knows what they're. I do. Yeah. The, the, um, I had a great time doing an audio book with a guy called Peter Forbes, who does Peter May's books. He's he's, a, he's an actor and he's just brilliant. Um, but yeah, he was. We had quite a few discussions about how we should <laughs> pronounce various different of uh, uh, Gaelic words. But yeah, no, he's he's such a great narrator with the book, and yeah, he does a great job with the Gaelic. Um, but yeah, I think he was a wee bit nervous about it, but he, he pulls it off. And uh, Heather and Callum, uh, both the areas that you guys are looking at have very strong local languages. Um, Heather, uh, did you? approach the kind of Aberdonian and the Doric and all of those things in the in the book? So there's, yeah, I mean, I, all my family kind of hail from those parts. So like Kate, I had their voices in my head a little bit and the just the, the method of speaking as well as, and the kind of the phrasing as much as any of the words um, and trying, you know, to make things accessible. And I, I did have a couple of words that kept being taken out in edits and I kept putting them back in because I was like, no, that's that's purposeful. That's how somebody would speak. Um, and so I, I, did, I had that in the back of my mind, definitely. I mean, my protagonist is um, the true crime podcaster is from the Midlands. And so he kind of comes up, he's an outsider, which I think a lot of podcasters often are. They tend to, you know, to go into to cases where um, they're the outsider perspective so I, I, I had the different kind of the voices there but the um, the victim Layla she worked in a country house hotel on the foothills of Benahi which is I, I waitressed in a, a country house hotel on the foothills of Benahi when I was a teenager for years and years and so I really had that kind of and almost not just the the words and and the the, the way of speaking but but the banter and the kind of all of that you know really stuck with me from from working there and so I tried to make sure that that was in the in the novel and talking of banter Callum you know squeaky cleans full of it the banter in the car wash in particular did you have any pushback about using a Glaswegian and Scots uh, not from the publisher not at all which was really cool because I made when I started writing it I, I made like the conscious decision to write all the dialogue in proper scotch and I dropped all the g's got rid of all the apostrophes everything like that because I wanted it to be as as people spoke in that part of town and uh, you know it was never an issue with the publisher they were they were pretty happy with that and I think I think like my editor is a big fan of the, the young team by Graham Armstrong so I feel I think I think the success of that book around that time when I was sending this out in submission was like a massive help really because it showed, you know, you can you can make this really popular mainstream novel uh, written. I mean, his is obviously written from first person is completely in Scots yeah. and that it can be a big success and people will relate to it and that the language isn't necessarily a barrier. You know, I have, the, there have been, some readers have said, oh, I can really get into it, but I, I think on the most part, people people have enjoyed it. And there's, there's just something about the Glaswegian sound that is, it is good for patter and jokes and things like that and I, I feel like if you if you change that it wouldn't it wouldn't come off the same way almost I completely agree and I remember the first time I read train spotting with its very you know leaf even more than Edinburgh mm. accent it took me a while to kind of tune my ears eyes and ears to it but you know then you get this great novel but I, I do wonder if we'd had this conversation five or six years ago whether there would have been more pushback against all of you using, you know, using the language that you have. So it's really great to hear that maybe, you know, things have, have changed and, you know, books like Graham's and others, the success has maybe helped to do that. So you're all on the debut prize list, but I can tell two of you have already said that, you know, you've written other novels. Um, so I was going to ask, how do you approach writing a debut novel? But uh, I, so, Callum, you said you'd written uh, uh, something and, and it's not got published, then you moved to Squeaky Clean. I think, Heather, you said something similar, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So, Kate, is this your, literally your debut or have you written other things which, you know, no. have you... No, I think, I mean, I think we've probably all got a novel in the drawer, haven't we? I don't know. Um, yeah, this is my... I've got a novel in the drawer. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got a novel that, 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 that didn't get a publishing deal. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. And... Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm exactly the same. I've got two uh, ma uh, manuscripts mouldering in a drawer, both Glasgow set, actually. Um, I, I lived in Glasgow for 10 years, um, so one set uh, in the West End, around about sort of maybe Welsh territory, actually. Um, uh, yeah, they're decent enough, I thought. I got, got some quite good feedback, but they didn't get published in the end, but hey-ho. <laughs> but that, that's interesting, because I think people here debut, and maybe I was guilty of this as well here, debut novelists, so... You know, you've just sat down with a pen and you get started and, you know, the genius came. But it's like most things in life. It's the hard, hard graft that's gone before. It's the edits and re-edits and all of those things that kind of get you to this stage. Um, so how do you feel, I guess, now that this has been published and you're on this prize list? Let's start with Heather, since you're at the bottom there. Yes incredible really I mean I've been writing for such a long time since I was 17 and it's probably only the last five years that I've been you know I've had an agent and I've had things to go out on submission but I had two books that went on submission and didn't sell uh, before Unsolved went out so I was quite used to the realities of publishing the you know those weren't unpleasant experiences I got really good feedback I got really you know helpful comments but ultimately it's a binary thing you've either got the publishing deal or you haven't so I mean a year ago I was sitting in Bloody Scotland listening to all the panels just hoping that one day I might be able to you know be on the edge of that somehow and never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be shortlisted for the debut prize it just wasn't even I didn't know that my publisher had put me forward for it either um and so it was a complete surprise to get the phone call from them to say that I was on the shortlist it's just and the thing that's really kind of blown me away is just how much support you get from the bloody Scotland team and how much of an effort they make to get us you know some exposure for being on the shortlist um bookshops in Scot across Scotland just really seem to be getting behind all of our books and it's unbelievable I had no idea it would be like that so yeah it's really really fun and, and also to be part of this group really and, and Heather Darwin who can't be with us you know it's kind of nice to feel like we're all in the same boat and yeah it's good fun and uh, there's a couple of things you mentioned there which I think we'll come back to um but it, certainly bloody Scotland seems to be such a success in terms of being a sign of quality I think for people who are not just like their crime fiction but fiction in general that does seem to be the case and I think the prizes associated with it really kind of help that but Kate what's your experience then of getting you know onto this list has it been a long time coming and and, uh, and how do you feel about it now you are well so I'm I'm a 48 year old debut so I'm as it's never too late to try to get published is what I would is what I always say to people um yes and I and it's and it's my second attempt at a book um so I I had a sort of rough idea for the maiden and pitched it at bloody Scotland um pitch perfect in 2020 which we were all in lockdown but they but, but they had a virtual version of it and it won pitch perfect in 2020 and you don't have to have a finished book to do that you can pitch with you know just with an, an idea and an outline so that's a, it's a really kind of open open competition for anybody who's who's thinking about putting a book together and that was probably the the one thing that changed everything for you know for me in terms of having um exposure because i was immediately um contacted by you know a, a, one agent on the day even before I, I had I had won she just liked the idea of, of of the book and then subsequently another agent got in touch and so I had two agents interested very very quickly and then um when when I signed with my agent who's who's um Viola Hayden at Curtis Brown and um, we were really able you know I got I got a book deal quite quite quickly afterwards and and so um being able to say that 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 it had won um Pitch Perfect was 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 hugely instrumental and then to have come up then to be shortlisted for the debut um is is just such a wonder I mean it's just such a privilege and and just such an absolute honor just to have, have this one one story that I probably thought started thinking about you know, as a child, you know, growing up in Christorfen, um, and probably wrote a very early version of it at school as a short story at the age of about eight. To have that single story come up all the way through um, the ranks like this has just been such an incredible journey. I wonder uh, if writers, in some way, are always writers even before they've started to write it down. They're thinking about stories kind of almost constantly. Uh, and Callum, what's been your experience uh, to get here and with publishing in general? I guess. Yeah, it's like like um like Kate and Heather. It's been a kind of long road. Like um, 
So Squeaky Clean is the fourth book that I've written. Uh, and I feel like with each one, I was just kind of getting that little bit closer to like public kind of just crawling my way there. Like the first one was no good. Second one got a small publisher that folded because of COVID, so it never came out. My third book, I won, I, I, I was shortlisted for a, the big issue crime writing competition. And the third book got me my agent and I was absolutely sure that this would be the one and it wasn't. <laughs> Um, so I, I kind of I started writing squeaky clean with almost almost sense of despair uh, at the whole thing, but as soon as it started going out, even the rejections I was getting were different, and it was yeah. like they were like they were like better rejections than I had before. So like yeah, to finally then get the publication and to see the book out on the shelf was like amazing. It was um actually it, it came out in the shops about a week before official publication. So I was just I was just out one day and, and saw it on the shelf in a Waterstones, and that was that was a pretty crazy moment because like, I, I wasn't like like I wasn't expecting it yet you know I hadn't prepared myself. So there was a kind of double yeah, tape in the shop. <laughs> yeah, I was just it was just I was kind of walking past and looked in and saw it on the the new bookshelf. Uh, yeah, so that that was pretty special, and then yeah, to then um to find its way onto the debut prize as well as yeah, I, I it's. I've been over the moon about it. It's um can't like overstate like what a big deal it feels like to kind of get to this stage now. Yeah. Uh, and full to more about yourself. Did you do you have expectations when you get I guess the first stage is as the rest have said, getting it published and, and recognized. And then do you have any expectations aside from that? Uh, not at all. That was the that was the goal, just to get the book out there on the shelves and it's one of those things it's almost you're almost desperate to do it at the end um i started writing unforgiven day in 2016 or 2015 i think it was um and it was picked up it was rejected by various um agents and publishers but it was eventually won a competition from a californian publisher called inkshares um it was chosen as one of their winners for this crime and mystery competition and i naively thought i've cracked it you know it's going to be out tomorrow it's going to be in the shop so i'm going to be a millionaire it didn't quite turn out that way. So that was sort of 2016. Over the course of five years, is it? I've been redrafting and redrafting and really digging down into the characters. And so I always think of the analogy of climbing when you reach a full summit and you think you've cracked out the top and then there's another full summit and eventually you think you see a summit. And again, it's not a full, again, it's not the right summit. But yeah, eventually you get there. Um, it's, it's an amazing feeling. And then you get recognised by uh, being uh, shortlisted. That's just amazing. I mean, Prior to that, when I was selected, I used to play Shinty and I was selected for Scotland when I was 21. That was my, my crowning achievement, but this has kind of surpassed it. And, and much less dangerous. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the scars have a story to tell there. There's a couple of things that you've all mentioned, which I'd like to, to dig into a bit deeper. One is the kind of, you, you all said about getting an agent and for people who are maybe keen to write themselves, how important is that relationship or even getting in the first place? Um, Fulton, let's start with yourself. Yeah, I think these days it's much more important. Um, I think when I first started submitting, it was more common to um, send unsolicited manuscripts to, to publishers. That I think pretty much never happens anymore, really. Um, a lot of, um, if you want to get published, a lot of the time you have to go through um, an agent. Um, my, the way I work is slightly, slightly different with, uh, with Inkshares. So, I've, so when it was picked up, it was picked up by the CEO of Inkshares, and he's a kind of he's an editor as well. So I work with him. So it's a kind of dual function. But yeah, I think getting an agent um, is really important. It's, it's really important, and, that, and the relationship has to be right as well because you're going to be spending a lot of time talking to them and uh, possibly arguing with them for the next, for possibly years to come so yeah you have to make oh, sure yeah. you get the right one. and Callum yourself what it, it, is that something that you found has been important yeah yeah my, my agent is Emily McDonald at 42 and yeah her, her input like her editorial input and just everything she's done for the book is, is invaluable and I uh it's, like if you're if you want to go like the traditional published route it's, it's kind of essential still and um but yeah I think the advice and the help that you get along the way with your agent is you know that certainly sharpens up your work and I actually um rather than the kind of traditional like querying I um I met Emily through a like a tweet pitch event that Expo North runs every year uh, where you kind of tweet your um 
like a, a pitch for your novel in the space of a, a tweet. So you've got your 140 characters. Um, but yeah, and I, I feel like I almost didn't bother doing it that year. Um, like I had this, I had this book and I, I was thinking about starting to send out to people and it was tweet pitch day and I was like, I almost didn't do it. And then I was just like, ah, me as well, you know? So I just battered out a quick tweet and sent it. And uh, yeah, I'm up with like, sometimes I think, oh, just, I'm so lucky I actually did that. <laughs> and then decide to like, to just give it a miss, you know? And so is there a aspect of editorial input from agents as well? That's something I wouldn't have thought. Yes. Definitely, definitely. My agent's amazing. She reads, I mean, some of my books she's read like six times um, in the process of preparing for submission. I mean, I had a bit of a twisting route to getting an agent because um, I met my agent actually in a Winchester Writing Festival. If you bought a ticket, you could get a couple of little um, sessions with, 10 minute sessions with agents and you sent them a little bit of your work beforehand and then they would tell you what they thought. And I sat down opposite Charlotte Seymour, who is my agent now. And she asked for the full manuscript, which was just, I mean, I came out of that meeting trembling and so excited. And then we sort of toed and froed until I was ready to go out on general submission. And when I did, I quite quickly got an offer from another agent and Charlotte hadn't been sure quite how she would place that book. It has an element of supernatural, interestingly, <laughs> what Fulton was saying earlier. Um, and so she said, well, look, you've got a great offer, go with, with the other agent. And I, I was with that agent for 18 months, reworking the book. And ultimately, the agent said, I've changed my mind. I, I don't want to submit this. So that was like a real blow because at the time I thought you get the agent, you're made, you're done. Great. You're, you're there. And I was, yeah, I felt so ashamed as well because I thought I'd done something really wrong. And I had to go back out on submission. And some very good author friends said to me, don't hesitate. Just do it today. Don't wait. Don't rework the book. Just go. And I thought to myself, well, Charlotte never actually turned down the book. So where's the harm? And I just sent her an email saying, look, please, you know, forgive me if you're not interested, but this is what's happened. And um, and I went out to other agents at the same time, but Charlotte was interested. And it it's, a, it's what Fulton says. I think it has to be the right relationship. It's really, I really trust her. And it's a very straightforward relationship. And I think if you've been in an agent relationship that doesn't quite work, you know, for nobody's fault, yeah. really, it's just not the right chemistry then I think you really appreciate, you know, how important it is to find an agent that you you get on with. And I think as an author looking for an agent, you know, you're so excited to get an offer that it's very hard to say to somebody looking for an agent, be careful, you know, make sure that you're going to get on together. But I, I do think it's good advice to do that. And and my relationship with Charlotte is incredible. The, I actually burst into tears when my book went on submission and she she put her name on it because after all of this she said with that book that the previous agent didn't want to submit she said look you're realistic about it it might not sell and it didn't sell but just the fact that she was willing to put it out there with her name on it that was a really big moment for me almost as big as getting a publishing deal in the end so um yeah is that just the case that you have someone who is on your side? And writing, obviously, is a pretty solo prospect for most of the time. And then you have someone who says, yeah, this is good. Yes. It literally, somebody else putting their name to it yeah. was meant a lot. Mm. And Kate, what's your experience of the agent uh, writer? Uh, well, I, I think there's so much mystery about, um, there's an idea, I suppose, that an author writes a book and everybody sort of agrees and publishes it. <laughs> and there's so many layers that happen, you know, between that. Um, I, I I was really interested in, 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 um, in my agent because um, I had spoken to two and um, what Viola said to me, and actually I was signed on a, on a partial, so I had only written half of the maiden. Mm -hmm. when I was pitching at Bloody Scotland and I got some really good advice which was um from um not from Bloody Scotland but 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 from author friends who said to me um because you've won Bloody Scotland don't don't wait and finish your manuscript because you'll be there all year just see if any agents are interested in, in in half of it and you've got nothing to lose so 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 I I I, I did submit half of the manuscript to to, to the two agents that had uh, made contact with me and Viola was one of them and what she said was really interesting um I asked her um you know if if she would make any changes to the manuscript and she said oh yes yes I would and she had this little list of things that she would 
she would change. So she wasn't happy with it as it was going. And she said, well, these are just a couple of suggestions. And I thought, oh, you really know what you're doing here. You know, and and and, and then we had a completely unrelated um, conversation about um, a TV show that we'd both been binging on through, through lockdown. So we had a personal connection, but I also knew that if I gave her the manuscript, she would make it really um, the best version of itself that it could possibly be. Uh, it's such an interesting conversation, this, because I think a lot of people, they think, as you say, you can send in a manuscript, and I've uh, done events with a lot of publishers now, and that tends not to be the case. You unsolicited manuscripts, there's, that pile is either gone or ignored these days. And also the fact that uh, the agent is working so closely with the book before they decide it's good enough to submit, which makes complete sense. But I don't think many people realise that that's a stage, as you were saying, Kate, there's these stages that people go through. So it's really interesting to hear. Well, friends and family were utterly shocked um, when, when I, you know, at, at the length of time it took between, um, you know, sort of getting an agent and then submitting and then the book being published. And, and, and they would kind of question me as if there was something wrong with my writing. Well, why does it need to have so many people editing it? You know, have you done any of it yourself? You know, and it really was genuine surprise that, that, that and, and, you know, and people saying, well, how do you feel about being edited? Surely if you're an author, then if you write something, then that's what you've written and, and you've got the final say. So there was, there was lots of misunderstanding about the industry and, and how it works, but actually it does. And I think, I think agents usually are editors. I mean, they've all done that kind of job in in house probably before, or 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 within their agency. So they their job is to know um to know the industry inside out, to know what's selling, um yeah. and, and to know the trends and to know what's going to um kind of work for a publisher. Yeah, I think probably in general the term agent has had a bad press in the past because you think of bands in particular who's you know Uncle Tom Parker with Elvis Presley being his agent and taking it all, but. In terms of publishing, it does seem increasingly perhaps that it's a hugely important relationship and something that uh, is, is a stage that's almost necessary now to getting a book published. And they do, they do so much as well, because I don't think people realise all the different stages. You know, you've got your initial contract when you get they put you out on submission, they speak to the editors, but it's sort of ongoing as well. You've got your audio rights. They'll shop those around. They'll put film and TV rights out there. They'll help, you know, if things, um, you know, they'll, they'll ask questions of the publisher that might be harder for the author to ask. And it's really useful to have this person also who knows what's normal, because when you become a debut author, you've got all these preconceptions about what will happen and when it will happen. And and actually, it's really good to have somebody go, no, 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 that's completely normal. Like my book was put back a few months and I thought, oh, my God, is that the end of the world? And, and my agent was like, no, pretty much every book gets put back a bit. And yeah, they're I really think, useful sounding yeah. boards. Yeah. What you say, Fulton? No, I've just said it's really tough. My, my book was put back at least over a year, actually, for, for a publication. Mm -hmm. And I'd already taken sort of four or five years to reach that stage. And then it's back another year. And I'm just like, what's going on here? <laughs> but yeah, I understood that it was it was kind of... Uh, just trying to get their ducks in a row, I suppose. But again, I think mine's slightly different in that my agent was also sort of part of the company that was going to publish it. So he really, if he, if he was going to put his name to it, it really had to be, you know, he was quite an anal kind of guy anyway, but he had to really, um, really dig down into it and redraft and redraft until it was absolute perfection as far as he was concerned, and then it was good to go. But yeah, just like you were saying, um, you were talking about input there. He had a lot of input in my books as well. He, he suggested lots of, um, he's good at suggesting things. And it was just like, well, how about we do this? Or how about we do that? And I was thinking, it's not we that's doing this, it's me that's going to have to write this. So he might, give, he might suggest, well, why don't you have this character um, doing something else? And it, it, it opens up a whole new plot line. You think, well, if I move that, or if I work in that plot line, then it's going to change something entirely different. But he would just sort of throw out these ideas and kind of expect me to, well, we had discussions about them, but some of them would just kind of expect me to <laughs> incorporate them into the book as a whole. But generally, they made them they made the book stronger. So I think that was people don't realise what a collaborative process getting a book written and or getting a book published, put it that way, is. You know, yeah. the, the, you've got your editor, you've got the designs of the cover, you've got all of those things that some you may have input in, some you may not, as I know from the past. But uh, but there is this huge kind of machine that goes on. Machine makes it sound awful when it's a creative process. But you know what I mean? There's, there, yeah. there is this kind of um, a 
group family, let's put it that way, a family of people supporting you to get the book because everyone wants the book to be its best. Yeah, and, and cover is, is such an important uh, part of it and, and is probably um, decided by the sales sales and marketing team. I think I think they tend to have um, final say in it because what they're doing is they're trying to make sure that your book sort of looks like other books in the genre but, but looks better, sort of stands out in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. And conversations about, about the cover um, can get quite um, can get quite difficult, I think, um, because everybody's just trying to sort of have their say in it. And that's the point at which I, I just step back. Is it, is it easy to step back or is it, you're just gonna go, I trust you and yeah. I was, I mean, I, I was definitely, um, I, I was lucky enough to, to to be asked for you know for my thoughts on the cover um of the maiden and i and i fed some ideas into it um but but when they were talking about how how big the words should be and and so on that's you know that's the point at which i, I just wouldn't be able to to make a you know to make a comment really so that's when i would i would step back this is an interesting strand to kind of develop further i think because crime fiction um particularly maybe a uh, uh, Glasgow crime fiction uh, uh, had a way it looked for a while. You know, they were nearly all almost the same black and white picture, perhaps a yellow coloured font. You know, everyone, yeah, well, the, the that original spooky, in every book cover for a while. Was, uh, was yellow Did instead you... of green, and it got, it, got, it got changed because because there was a lot of grey backgrounds with yellow writing happening. Yeah, so exactly. that colour got changed. So, well, well, Callum, let's start with you there. Um, how, how did did you have input to the cover? And uh, what was the case? Um, well, they sent, I'm trying to think here, they, they, they sent the sample that was made and I thought it was pretty cool. And um, yeah, my agent was kind of like, it's like a, the, she was like, the text is quite plain looking. So like the text, so they, they came back with another, with another cover that was a different colour and the text was slightly changed. And that was kind of the one we ended up going with. But I like, um, so my publisher, Pushkin Press, they do like, I've collected loads of their books over the years and the, their designs are really cool and I've always liked that about that publishing house. So I kind of I, I kind of just trusted them with it, you know? Like I, I kind of, I was just like, I, I feel I know, like they know what they're doing with this, you know? So I was kind of, you know, they, they asked like what I thought about it really, but it's I, was, I was pretty happy anyway. I was happy to kind of go with what they think would work. Well, I would say you, when you pick it up, you don't immediately think, Glasgow crime novel, which I think is a good thing. You know, I think that there was certainly for a while there was ones which were almost identical. Um, Heather, what about you? And in, in terms of the cover of the book? Yeah, so I mean, it was a really collaborative process actually, and and everything with my publisher has been Canelo. I found them really, um, just really they give you a lot of information, and it kind of none of my edits have felt like they're not my choice or anything, and they've all kind of been building to make it better we did have a previous cover that didn't quite work and there was a really kind of collaborative a moment where we all sort of thought well actually that that cover wasn't distinctly Scottish it didn't like it make enough of the landscape which is a really big inspiration for the book and so I ended up sending them a lot of pictures of the Benahee area where I'd been um you know what I've been thinking about when I've been writing and then we looked at some other of their covers that really kind of did because they have a really strong stable of Scottish and Scottish set books um and yeah that I'm I was so happy with the cover and I've got the cover for the second book which is out in January and it's very much kind of in keeping with that one and it's got some yellow writing on it as well <laughs> so we go we're jumping on the yellow bandwagon for next time but yeah it was um I think it is so important because there are definitely things that I don't understand about the process that they do you know they know it has to look in keeping it's a certain kind of book people are busy you know they're not all like us they you know we read reviews and we think about books we're going to buy and we go to waterstones and we do all of that and, and a lot of people are busy shopping they may be picking up a book much more quickly and they need to know what sort of book it is the second they look at it um and so they understand all of that i think um and that's just really is when you kind of you trust their expertise because they're doing this every day and they know what works such a difficult balance to be recognizable in terms of something can read somebody can read the signs that the cover gives and says yeah that's my kind of book but also standing out from the crowd that, that uh, they're also doing the same thing or at least trying to do the same thing 
you want a really good version of whatever your book is, I think, because the last thing you want is for a reader to pick something up and then be disappointed and give you a bad review because <laughs> it wasn't what they planned. <laughs> and Phil, to what about yourself and, and the cover of the book? But... Yeah, that was, again, it was quite a torturous process. Um, American covers, interestingly, are, are they've got a totally different um, take on covers, I think, in America. So there was a kind of, um, there was a bit of to and froing there uh, between the sort of the American side and my publicist about what would actually work as a cover. Um, for instance, I'll show you here, we've got, we've got a kind of, it looks like it's kind of um, fallen in the water, this cover, right? it's got that kind of, but we had, um, before that we had one that had a sort of tear down the middle of it, and there was some, some bits of blood in it and stuff like that, and um, publicist, UK publicist said, no, we can't go for that, that's too horror. You might get away with that in America, but you'll not get away with that over here. Um, we also had sort of inside, I don't know if you can see this, it's got a kind of, it's almost like a Hieronymus Bosch sort of painting type thing. It's, yeah, yeah. There's a scene in the book. And again, that was kind of, um, um, that was overruled by the sort of UK side of things. Um, this is, again, this is not really a, a typical sort of tarot noir or crime novel cover, I don't think. But it kind of, um, I like it. Um, I like it to be a wee bit different. But um, yeah, it was, it was torturous. There was maybe six, seven different covers I've seen for this book, maybe more. <laughs> Poor guy who's doing design. It's a guy called Tim Barber from Dissex Designs. I just felt sorry for myself. Emails after emails saying, "Sorry about this man. <laughs> you're you're getting really put under the pressure here." But yeah, eventually we went for this one. But yes, that's just it's just a tension between the, the American the American side of things and the UK side of things. Uh, that is interesting. And when I worked in publishing, it was one of the conversations that would become, as you said, Kate, perhaps the most heated, where you would have six or seven or eight different covers there, and there would just be the tiniest difference between them and uh, and all of those things but actually the end result um is is amazing and you know um we did i, I was really lucky because waterstones did a special edition of 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 the maiden so it's, it's it's out in hardback and it does it doesn't even come out in paperback until um until february so it's getting a really long run as a hardback and waterstones um gave it a special edition with um sprayed edges and 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 things like this and and and, and i had to sign um 2000 um tippins you know to go into the into the book and and what what and it sold out quite quickly and it's and it's interesting because i think people buy books because they have a beautiful cover so that's really why they're buying it they're not necessarily buying it because they think the story is going to be up their street they just think oh there are there are there's a certain type of reader who likes to have their bookshelf full of beautiful collectible books and that's one, you know, that's one kind of part of the readership that you are appealing to. Um, a lot, a lot of historical fiction has 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 got, you know, these kind of beautiful uh, covers. And and I, and I, when I see the maiden sort of next to some of the crime books, I think, well, oh, it, it does stand out a bit. It does stand out a bit differently, you know. It does look different. Um, but it but it it does kind of fit the kind of genre of the you know modern retelling kind of historical genre. It it, it does look like it's in its place there. Um, but yes, yeah, so it is. It, it, it's a long process. But when you see it, um, you know, when you like, like you were saying, you know, when you when you when you walk into a bookshop and you and you see it for the first time, and that's just the most, it's just a mind blowing experience, particularly when you love the cover so much. I think it's still something which some publishers, a uh, don't spend enough time, uh, you know, making sure the, the the book might be the best thing in the world, but you've got to get the cover right, or or less, as you say, as you all say, it may not read may not reach the readership it deserves to, which is, you know, which is, and the main thing is the book in, in, inside. And something else that someone mentioned was about the support in general from Bloody Scotland, I think, but maybe it seems to me, I've spoken to a lot of crime writers over the years, and there seems to be a camaraderie and support between writers that there might not be elsewhere in other uh, genres of writing or just, I, do you think, first of all, do you think that's the case? Do you think there is a kind of people rooting for each other at things like Bloody Scotland? Yes, Heather, you're nodding your head, so I'll start. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think my, I mean, I don't have experience of any other genre, but I found that the crime writing genre is such a distinct kind of part of the industry and there's a lot of events. And I think people, so people get face to face quite a lot. And I've just had so much support from more experienced authors who've, been there before who understand you know the ups and downs of it because I think a writing life is all about ups and downs and I certainly had this perception that once I had my publishing deal 
everything would be golden. And actually, as I've got to know more authors and seen their experiences, you know, bestsellers and people with incredible successes behind them will have bad times. You know, there might be a book that doesn't get picked up or something else that's not kind of gone right. And, and it was the realization for me that the writing life is quite up and down and that you should kind of get used to that and not have it define how you're going to feel about it so and that's all come from other writers that's all come from meeting people I do just find you know crime writers are so friendly and so welcoming um blurbing each other's books and being supportive it, it makes a huge difference I think because writing can be quite solitary but then you can can all get together at bloody Scotland or, or another festival and and kind of swap news <laughs> that kind of sort uh dichotomy that the, the writers and they can write the most gruesome grizzly scenes and some and are often the most nice people that you will ever meet or talk to Carl, yeah. what's been your experience of just i guess doing things like this or events uh you know uh, like bloody scotland have you found that it's a real kind of supportive community yeah definitely it's uh it's been great i was i did um Cromarty Crime Festival uh, earlier in the year and it was brilliant meeting meeting other people and chatting with them and I met uh, Shona McLean, who's on the McIlvany Prize this year for uh, the bookseller of Inverness, and she was just, she was so nice, and she she obviously, she's she's had quite a few books out now, and it was just great to talk to someone who's, like, kind of been through all these kind of stages already that I've passed and has experience to pass on, and uh, I, I met Ian Rankin briefly, which was crazy, but he was just really nice. He was a very nice, down-to-earth man. <laughs> um, and he was yeah he was yeah just giving giving little bits of advice and things like that um, uh, uh, Fulton have you found that uh, there's been you know people are on your side within the you know within the writing community in terms of crime I'm not saying it doesn't happen elsewhere by the way I'm just yeah. saying it does seem to me uh, something that whenever I talk to crime writers this comes back and I see people doing events together often off their own back or doing other things together off their own back there does seem to be a real kind of community feel you think that's correct no i think so um my first event um that i did was was i right in glasgow um <clears throat> just back in the summer there and it was uh, neil lancaster and uh, carol johnston were in the panel oh neil's uh, great I'm, I'm, yeah great. Neil was funny. really good, good good value and it was jackie collins was the sort of the host and she was brilliant just made you feel so at ease so that was a really uh that was a really uh nice way to to um to, to to sort of break my duck in these sort of things and 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 and, and um yeah I, I found it really really interesting but it, it sort of brings me back to something that i heard someone much more clever than me said that other authors aren't really the people that we should be worried about competing against we should be competing we should be worried about like netflix and amazon prime and, and these sort of things so other authors aren't really our competitions it's these sort of other platforms that we should worry about so there's no reason to 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 develop any sort of rivalries, although I, I suppose um, maybe sort of more pretentious literary types might disagree with that. But I think the crime writers in general would probably subscribe to that idea as well. I think uh, for me, it's a bit like uh, indie music or music in general in Scotland now that it's so difficult to get things sold and out there that people feel they're all in the same boat. So therefore, they're kind of helping each other rather than working against each other. And that's a, a good point that you make, uh, Fulton. And Kate, do you feel that you've got the crime community and you've got the historical fiction community that you've got this uh, dual role, if you like? There's lots because there's the debut community as well. So I, I think I think writing is such a weird solitary um, activity when you create a fictional world that you are, you know, the god of, and you just kind of do that at, at odd hours of day and night. Um, I think it's I think it's when you meet uh, and, and, and interact with other writers, you're kind of meeting people who are very very like minded. And, you know, people who understand what it's like to have kind of gone through that entire process and had failures and ups and downs, you know, on, on the roller coaster. There's just, a, I think there's just a meeting of minds about it and, and also a joy of reading about it as well, which, which kind of, you know, brings, brings people together. And I think that's why bloody Scotland and festivals, book festivals like it are such a great thing because there's a real celebration when when people when writers meet their uh, readers and 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 meet each other and all of those things there feel it seems to be a real celebration of writing and that a solitary part of it suddenly becomes this communal part you know you suddenly uh, you realize that you're part of something bigger than just you know typewriter or a keyboard or a pen even if you do those kind of things 
I could talk to you all for so much longer, but I think I've probably kept you long enough. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and uh, all the very best with the, the debut prize and for everything else in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be back soon with another Bloody Scotland podcast. <laughs>